This story starts in the spring of 2019, right around the last time we had an in-person Codebean conference here in Stockholm. Stavros held a talk titled, What does Dialyzer think about me? At this point, our code base had around 12,000 Dialyzer errors in it. And I tried to imagine, what would Dialyzer think about that? <laughs> Fixing all of the errors was generally considered undoable by many of my fellow developers. I mean, if you do, even if you did manage to work at a constant rate of fixing 10 errors per day, you would still need three years to fix all of them. And there had been several attempts to fix these over the years, but none of them had been particularly successful. Partly because there was been a lack of focus and planning, but mostly because none of them were preventing new errors from appearing in the code base. code base we're talking about is Klarna's CRED application. A high availability financial application which lies at the core of Klarna's business in many countries. Bugs in this system can have disastrous consequences. And I was asking myself the question, are we doing everything we can to reduce the risk of bugs in the system? And 12,000 dialyze errors and no plan to fix them? The answer to that question could only be no. CRED is a large and very active code base with something like 45 developers merging something around 100 branches a month. And we have zero downtime upgrades several times a week. The application is running 24-7, and we're only seeing a few out incidents and outages. So in general, we're looking at something which is large and complex, but still stable and reliable. So why are we talking about Dialyzer then? Dialyzer is a great tool to find errors in your Erlang or Elixir code bases. But if the code is stable and reliable, and we don't have many incidents, is it still worth the massive effort needed to fix 12,000 errors? Of course it is. We're going to fix all the actual bugs in there. So we're guessing that most of these are actually false positives. But there will be a number of actual bugs which are hidden in there. And we're going to find and fix them. And we won't be able to do that unless we actually fix all of these 12,000 errors. No. no, I have lost my focus. No. OK. And also. New bugs in untested code may be hiding this noise of all the false positives. So the main message in my presentation here is threefold. It is indeed possible to find and fix all dialyzer errors in any Erlang and Elixir code base. It is also possible to make sure that no new errors appear. And this will improve your application. You will have less bugs it will be easier to read and understand, and it will be safer to change. And I'll show you how to do this using three guiding principles. Automation. Run dialogues in your build pipeline to prevent new errors. Understand what dialogues is saying about your code. And finally, execute. Make a focused effort on fixing all of the errors. My name is Jesper Eskesson, and I worked many years with large code bases, trying to keep them free of compiler errors and static analyzer errors. I spent lots of time improving and automating build systems in Erlang, C, C++, Java, and other languages. 
I currently work at Klarna, maintaining the credit application. This talk will describe our journey towards a dialyze clean code base and how you can achieve the same result using these three guiding principles of automate, understand, and execute. So let's start with the first principle, automation. I started at Klarna four years ago, and while I was getting acquainted with the cred code base, I started to talk to people at Klarna about Dialyzer. And the first thing that became painfully obvious was that we had no control over the errors that were lurking in the code base, primarily because we didn't really have a way to run Dialyzer on the entire code. We had a build pipeline, of course, but it wasn't running Dialyzer. Many of our developers had given up on Dialyzer. It was slow to run required lots of RAM, and one developer who had been a client for a long time told me that it used to melt your laptop, and that was probably true at the time, but not really anymore. Some parts of the code was in pretty good shape, but large parts of the code had never been exposed to dialyzer at all. And having worked on many years trying to keep code bases free of errors and warnings, I wanted us to do better than this. So I started doing some under-the-radar work to try to at least be able to run Dialyzer in the build pipeline and get a grip on how many errors we had. The first runs were depressing. It took 15 minutes to run and produced 12,000 errors. So it became clear to me then what was to become the first of these three guiding principles and the one we need to be addressed first, automation. The primary reason for this is that you need to prevent new dialyzer errors before you do anything else. I refer to this as slaying the type hydra, since dialyzer errors, much like the mythological creature, tends to sprout new heads as you cut off existing ones. Secondly, the output from dialyzer is pretty sensitive to how you run dialyzer, what options you use, how you compile your code, and what code you analyze will affect the output in ways which are not trivial to predict. And having the build pipeline run dialyzer for you in the build pi pipeline exactly the same way all the time ensures that you know exactly which errors you have in your code base. If we only had, say, say 100 errors, this wouldn't be a problem. We could just focus, take, take a few hackathons, and fix all of the errors, and we're done. But at the scale that we were facing with 12,000 errors, this wasn't doable. We had no estimate of how long time it would take to fix all of the errors. And we wanted something that could work even if we weren't working on fixing the errors all the time. So we needed a way which could prevent new errors while still allowing for a large number of errors which were already, th which were already there. So it took a bit of time for us to define and implement something that would actually allow us to do this, primarily because we didn't really know exactly what does new mean. What is a new error? Eventually, we landed on something like this. We have a master branch, and no developer are committing directly to the master branch, but we are only merging feature branches into this. And so for every build on the master branch, we are running Dialyzer and creating a baseline error set. And then we're uploading this to some external storage. In our case, Amazon S3. And then we keep constructing these baseline error sets for every build on the master branch. And then along comes a developer who wants to do a change. We create a feature branch, and then we push it and the build server kicks in and starts building this. And then we use git merge base to find the start of the feature branch. We fetch the corresponding baseline, and now we can compare. We can compare the errors in the baseline with the errors in the feature branch. And the ones which are in the feature branch but not in your baseline, those are your new errors in your feature branch. And now we can start failing builds. And this will effectively prevent any errors from being merged into the master branch. And this needed to be put in place before we really could start doing any real work. So to this entire mechanism relies on the possibility of comparing errors. And this, so we basically need to know 
when are two errors the same error, and when are they not the same error. And the straightforward way of doing this is, of course, just to compare the error messages. But this is not without problems. We have a function here which has an invalid type specification. And Dilate will complain about this, saying, we have an error on line five. And along comes a developer who tries to add a new function, boss. And there's nothing wrong with this function. But the error message has moved to line nine. So with our scheme of preventing new errors, this will count as a new error. So this developer would have to fix this error before it does anything else. And forcing developers to fix all errors in source files that they even touched was considered too harsh and improductive. So we decided to ignore the line number when comparing error messages, essentially meaning that errors can move around freely in the source file. Uh, but as soon as the error message itself changes, or if it moves to another file, then it's considered new. It may be too harsh to f always fail a, a feature branch if you find new dialyze errors in it. We had three cases where we allowed the developer to skip and use an override switch. New errors may be uncovered in previously unreached code. And I'll talk more about this later when I'm talking about hidden errors. Errors may move. And we saw previously that kind of errors moving within the same source file, they were so common, so we decided to fix those automatically. But errors can al also move when you move an entire function to another source file or when you rename a module. And in that case, we decided that developers could kind of skip fixing new dialyze errors in this case. And the last case was for fixing production outages. In a few cases, we had production outages which had to be fixed by an emergency deployment, and we wanted to avoid having to fix dialyze errors in that. And this was, of course, done with extreme caution to make sure that these dialyze errors were actually not real bugs. So to recap, preventing new errors may sound like a trivial concept, but it's actually really important. Without it, you'll be fighting this type hydra, and new errors will appear faster than you were able to fix them. But if you know that no new errors will appear, you're almost halfway home. So now that we've stopped new errors from appearing, we can turn our attention to actually understanding the errors we have and how to fix them. Large parts of the cred source code was essentially untouched by Dialyzer, including many type specifications. Lots of them were correct when they were written, but over time, code diverges, and the type specification become incorrect. A very frequent case of this was when developers add new clauses to an existing function, but they forget to update the spec. We also know that bugs in production code tend to get noticed because things break. So we made the assumption that we have few actual bugs in production code because we know the application is stable and reliable and we don't get many outages. So we formed this hypothesis that most of these 12,000 error messages are either actual bugs, but on dead code paths, or false positives caused by bad specs. And this hypothesis turned to be quite accurate, and it helped us when diagnosing some of the more difficult errors. Not all dialyze errors are created equal. Some are more devious than others, while some are better left for later. Some are more likely to be the cause of false positives, while some are only indicators of dead code. I'll help you prioritize these, so you know which errors to focus on first. But first, something about Dialyzer, a common misconception. It is often claimed that Dialyzer is never wrong. But it would be more correct to say that Dialyzer does not guess. Dialyzer is more a theorem prover, where it'll tell you if there's an inconsistency somewhere. Like, these two things cannot both be true. This often leads to cryptic and misleading error messages, when Dialyzer is unable to tell you exactly which one of these things are true and which are not but it knows that it cannot both be true. 
Being a theorem prover, dialogues will rely on certain things you tell it, like type specifications. And it is notoriously bad at dealing with type specifications which are wrong. And bad type specifications are a frequent cause of confusion when running dialogues. As we've seen before, dialogues will complain about bad specification when it's able to by emitting an invalid type specification error. And I highly recommend on fixing these early because they're prone to produce false positives and cause general confusion. Fixing bad specifications is not only necessary for dialysis to be able to produce correct results, it also makes your code easier to understand and read, as you can rely on the type specification to be correct. So let's go through some common problems you might encounter when you're trying to fix dialysis errors, in roughly in the order which you should focus on them. We already talked about invalid type specifications. We have unknown types, cascading false positives, hidden errors, record constructions, opaque types, failing calls, dead code, and no return. Dialyzer will, by default, not report unknown types. I'm not sure of the reason for this, but I highly recommend using the unknown option when running dialyzer. Otherwise, any unknown types will be silently replaced by the any type. This can be very confusing, as it silently ignores any type information that might have been there in the unknown type, which may be misspelled or just simply doesn't exist. This is an example. It's a file name function which tries to return a file name, and it has a type specification saying file name colon name. But it returns a tuple of binaries, and Surely this is not correct, but dialyzer doesn't complain. Why? File lib colon name doesn't exist. There is no type called that. So let's try to fix this by using a type called file colon name, which actually does exist. Then dialyzer will complain that this is an invalid type specification, and it'll tell you about this thing. It doesn't say anything about this, though, so that's confusing. So lesson number one, always use unknown when running dialyzer, or at least be aware that if you're not, then you will not catch these unknown types if you're typing, mistyping and stuff. A very common pattern of errors is what I've chosen to call cascading false positives. This is when a single dialyzer error causes a series of other errors often upwards along the call chain. So here we have a call chain starting with main, ending in read file. But there's a bug in here. And because this will never match, because read file will return OK bin instead. And dialyzer will complain about this, saying the pattern can never match the type. But then you handle all of those function has no local return as well. And they are essentially false positives because they're pointing to code which there is nothing wrong with that code. The code just happens to be in the way of an error cascade. So the error function has no local return is notorious for confusing developers. I've had lots and lots of people come to me and ask, why is this function has no local return? And it's partly because it's overly technical phrasing what does this even mean? I mean, has no local return. What does it mean? But also because it's so often a false positive. It's mostly a kind of trail. It's kind of breadcrumb trail you can follow to find the actual cause. So these are difficult to deal with, partly because it's difficult to know exactly when it's an error part of this such a cascade, but it's also it can be really tricky to find the root cause. So. Be observant if you have many similar errors in the same source file. Then you're probably looking at an error cascade, or at least they are probably related. Follow the call chain downwards to find the root cause. This may be, diff more, may be easier to say <laughs> said than done, but it's really, really important to find, if you want to find the root cause. And some errors are more prone to do this, like has no return and record construction. I'll talk more about record constructions later. Another quirk is that some errors are prone to hide other errors. 
this function here, count bytes in file, has the same bug as before. It uses true instead of okay. And Dialyzer complains about this. And nothing is really strange here. But let's try to fix this. What do you think will happen? We suddenly get this new error here. The call Erlang length will never return since. And this is the same code. The length call is there in the first function as well. So this error is hidden in the first, first code because Dialyzer can't even get there. Dialyzer can't see this code because it will overthrow an exception before it. And these had his hidden error can be extremely frustrating because people will start fixing things and then suddenly, oh, I fixed a Dialyzer error, and then you're awarded by another 10 errors because you suddenly, Dialyzer can suddenly see more of the code and, oh, there's more errors here. So we allow developers to skip the dialyzer check in those cases. Okay? If you can prove that you actually fixed one bug and you get these 10 new unrelated ones, then you can skip the dialyzer check. Fortunately, these errors tend to disappear once you kind of found, made sure that dialyzer can actually see all your code, then these errors disappear. So record definitions may contain types. And when they do, you need to conform to the types in every place where you construct a record. And if you're not specifying a field when you're constructing a record, the field will get the value undefined. So if you have a type, if you have a field with a type, and that type doesn't include the value undefined, that means that you always need to specify a value for that field. Because otherwise, the default value undefined would violate the type. We have a record state here with three fields. The first two are do not include the value undefined, so you must always specify them. And the last one, you don't need to specify. And now you get this record construction error because we're this num undefined here violates the type integer. So this is not really not nothing really strange, but it's worth noting that not only does record construction does dialyzer complain about a record construction? It also assumes that this will throw an exception. While in reality it really wouldn't. But we see the start of this, this cascading chain here where this has no local return. So everywhere where you construct such a record, dialyzer will assume that the code will blow up. So you have three options when fixing record constructions. You can either kind of take the easy way of relaxing the type specifications and just add the type, kind of add undefined to the type. This is kind of safe because we don't need to actually change any code. If you're a little braver, you can actually start modifying the code so you actually try to follow the types. But that means that, of course, you need to trust the types then. Or you can move the types to a separate type declaration, which means that you can construct the record in any way you want but the type checking won't happen until you actually pass the record to a function. Opaque types are types which are non-transparent and you're not allowed to look into them from the outside. You can essentially just pass them around. And they are tricky because they're incompatible with things like Erlang developers take for granted, like pattern matching. You're not allowed to pattern match on an opaque value. So we have a function here. We have a module called defining an opaque type connection. And we have a function new, which returns 42, which is typed to be a connection or undefined. Now then we have this client who tries to, to use this and tries to pattern match on this server new thing here with undefined. And dialer says, no, you can't do that. This value is opaque. You're breaking the opacity by trying to check if it's undefined. So how do we fix this? Well, in this case, we can fix this by wrapping the opaque type in an op the opaque type in an OK tuple, like this. And now we can return this, and the user of the API doesn't need to pattern match on the opaque value itself, but they can ma pattern match on the OK tuple instead. And this is OK. So the rules for what you're allowed to do with opaque types are extremely difficult to follow 
if you're not running dialyzer. And opaqueness violations will inevitably sneak into your code if you're not careful. So you have two choices when fixing opaqueness violations. The first one is to kind of fix it, like rewrite the code so you're not uh, violating opaqueness. But this may be a lot of work. Or you can cheat. This is what we did most of the time. And just replace the opaque thing with type. And just make the type non-transparent. And if David Escher is here, yeah, he's over there. He holds the record of most dialyzer errors fixed by changing a single line of code at 1,500, I think. <laughs> so yeah, so opaqueness violations are really, really hairy without uh, to, to fix if you're not running dialyzer. So failing calls. So one of the most, most common and, and important and maybe difficult problems to fix is when dialyzer says that this function call will never return because you're violating some type. And this is a kind of really, really simple variant of this. We have a function add, which adds two integers. And then we try to call this with, with uh, two atoms. And this will, of course, this is not allowed. And dialyzer will complain about this. So dialyzer says something along the lines of the call something will never return because something. And these errors have a high risk of being actual bugs. Once you've fixed all your type specifications, these are at high risk of being actual bugs. So take your time to understand them. So I covered some errors which you should kind of prioritize. I'll talk about two errors you can leave for later. One of them is dead code. So the Erlang compiler will complain about kind of obvious cases like unused local functions. And Dialyzer can use type inference to find that you can have clauses which doesn't match, We can never match. Like this function increment. It's only ever used with a, func with a value 42. So we know that the first case will always hit with this guard expression, and the second clause can never match. And Dialyze will say something along the lines of the variable something can never match because the previous clauses completely cover something. And these errors will never cascade. So they're kind of safe to leave for later. Um, but a pro common problem in our case was that whether or not the code was actually dead or not depended on what we had, depended on what we had in our database. So we would read something from the database and send it to a function, and the function had a spec which may or may not agree with what we actually had in the database. So in many cases, we had to relax the specs to actually be sure that they actually cover everything which happened to be in our database. So the no return type is a special type which is used to indicate that the function never returns, like Erlang halt. It is not like Java throws, where it says this function might throw an exception. So dialyzer can complain uh, when you try to do things like call Erlang halt and then do other things after that. But there is a common anti-pattern here that I've seen, is when people try to combine new re no return with something else. Like here. The function check integer will return true if it's an integer or it throws an exception. But then it's spec to return true or no return. But this doesn't make sense. Dialyzer types in type specifications, think of them as sets of values. So the type atom or integer refers to the set of all atoms and integers. And the type no return refers to the empty set. So combining this, combining a value, combining a type with no return doesn't make sense. And fix these by just removing the no return part. So I talked a bit, a bit about common problems that you may encounter. Let's cover some general advice before moving on to the last principle. Don't get discouraged about a large number of errors. This is maybe the most important thing. Pick one error, understand it, and fix it. And remember that your build server has your back and is preventing any new errors from making it into, into the code base. If you're confused about a type specification, try commenting it out and see what happens. 
run without type specification using the no spec option. This will give you a much smaller set of errors because Dialyze can tell you a lot less things about your code, but you know that the errors you get are not caused by bad specs. And as a final kind of, if everything, if you're still confused, try leaving it for later if you can. Because chances are that it may be a false positive. It may, the error may be in a completely different place. So let's recap the understanding principle. Start by fixing invalid specs first. They're generally confusing. Then unknown types, record constructions, and no local return. They're kind of generally causing hidden errors and false positives. Failing calls are often real bugs, so take your time with them. And leave dead code and no return for later. So the final principle, execute. Dialyze errors may be difficult to understand, but often the biggest obstacle lies in actually getting time to work on the problem. I'll try to describe a few things which may help you avoid getting stuck. Focus. So many of our efforts to fix dialect errors failed because there's a lack of focus and planning. Often it sounds like, hmm, we should really get around to fix these. We have lots of errors, like this is really important. But now we need to fix these important features first. Dialect errors is a form of technical debt. And fixing them won't make it up on your roadmap unless you as developers put them there. And you won't be able to, ex to kind of make time to work on dialect errors unless you can convince others that it's important. And you may have to talk to managers who have no clue about what dialect error is. And like, how do you explain this in business terms? Like, developers are more productive in a well-maintained code base. Or less bugs means fewer, produ fewer production outages. New features become less risky. Visualize your progress. Use a wall monitor and plot your progress so you can see how far we come. How many dialysis errors do we have today, right now? This can help your team to focus and to see that there's progress. It's not hopeless. And knowing how to fix dialysis errors is a skill. And when you're fixing dialysis errors, you will gain experience and knowledge. And spread this to your coworkers by helping them when they run into problems. Because they will run into problems. They will run into bad specs and be generally confused. Start with code you already know. This may be self-evident, but it's much easier to find dialysis errors in code that you're familiar with. And I've tried to do the opposite, digging into other people's teams, other, other teams' codes, and see why is this error here, and I have no idea what the code does. And that's really tricky. And generally, don't despair. Fixing thousands of errors is daunting. You fix some errors, if you're lucky, you get some false positive to vanish for free. Some, one of the very last errors that we fixed was an error that I've been giving up on and coming back and revisiting several times. And it was always kind of keeping me, like, I had no idea what was going on. And it turned out to be false positive, caused by a bad specification in a place which I didn't think of looking in, and which Dialyze was unable to tell me that the spec was bad. But don't despair. Uh, remember that all any bug you fix is not coming back, and the build service continuously keeping new errors off your back. So let's put all this together using our three guiding principles. Automation. Run dialyzer in your build pipeline and fail every build which contain new dialyzer errors. This is the essence of slaying the type hydra. And if you remember nothing else about this talk, this is it. Understand what dialyzer is saying about your code and take your time. Don't blindly fix things just because dialyzer says there's an error here. Because you may be looking at a false positive. 
there may be an invalid type specification somewhere else, which is the actual root cause. Make time to work on fixing errors. Don't wait for someone to give you time. Don't wait for someone to tell you you must fix stylized errors. Work proactively and make your time. And if needed, use business arguments. Try to argue with business terms if you need to. Oh. Make your progress visible to your team and spread your knowledge by helping your coworkers. So, how did it go? We started out with 12,000 dialyzer errors. And 18 months later, we had a dialyzer clean code base. This was much faster than I ever would have hoped for, with an average rate of fixing 20 errors per day. And the reason for this was, of course, that there were lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of false positives among these 12,000 errors. I don't have any real statistics because I, I forgot to count, but there were lots of them. So along the way, we found and we fixed a number of real bugs. We fixed tons of broken type specifications, and tons of them, I really mean tons of them. We added types to a lot of data structures, and we improved lots of comments and documentation. And as a result, the code is, has less bugs in it, it's easier to read, and it's safer to change. And hours of engineering time has been saved because bugs never reaching production. And since then, the code has stayed dialysis clean. We showed that a large code base such as CRED can be made dialysis clean, and then it can stay there using the three guiding principles of automate, understand, and execute. I call on everyone to make sure your code base is dialysis clean and keep it there. Thank you for listening. All right. Uh, we have time for questions. Do we have questions here? Or already one down there. Oh, we have a lot of questions. All right. I'm going to go in the order that ask. Oh, I'm, I did the wrong way. Just stay there. Stay there. I'll go. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, so 12,000 errors is a lot. I'm wondering, like you said that there was also a lot of false positives. I'm wondering, uh, did you run into any false positives caused by bugs in Dialyzer itself, not in your code base? And if so, did you go uh, as far as fixing them? Or did you like... Uh we didn't find any Dialyzer, we didn't find any bugs in Dialyzer itself. So okay, thank you. <laughs> I mean, we might, I mean, not that I know of. Uh, we may have run into some, some weirdness with Dialyzer, and in some cases, it's. We, we ran into so, uh, some cases where you could argue that it was a bug in Dialyzer, but that was an argument, <laughs> and we had that argument. And I don't think Costis is here, but I think he was involved in at least one of those. <laughs> so it, it's kind of, I mean, if Dialyzer says something like, a function has no local return, or this code will always crash or never return, and I know for a fact that that's not true. <laughs> because, I mean, the code is running, so I know that that error message is not true. So often you run into the ca this case of, you have. Dialyzer is saying something in your error message, and the, the literal meaning of the error message is false, because you can prove it. But I don't really call that a bug in Dialyzer. Well, it's kind of a usability thing, because it's, Dialyzer is, it, it's one of these confusing error messages caused by Dialyzer being a theorem prover. So it doesn't really know if you have a bad spec here and some function which behaves in a way here. Dialyzer will say that, no, that's not possible, and it'll tell you, like, okay, this function is broken, while in reality it's the type specification somewhere else which is broken. So whether or not this is a considered a Dialyzer error, I'll kind of open for our argument.
Does it work? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So first one comment. E your exact story is the same one that we happen to have in Nextroll. It's in a blog post that we wrote, and it's that is basically the same thing. You are not alone. It happened multiple times. And this, the question now is, what's next? Will you check with Xref, Hank, Elvis, or other things, or dialyzer is enough for you? Uh, sorry, I didn't. I didn't catch that question. Could. So good. He asked about the question on Hoover as well. So uh, uh, the question is, what is next about dead code? So will you uh, use other tools like Xref or Hank? So when I was talking about unknown here, I was primarily concerned about unknown types. So in our case, we are using Xref to root out all the unknown types, or sorry, unknown functions. So and in our dialyzer wrapper script that we ran, we didn't display unknown functions because we knew that we had xref to take care of that. And our xref invocation is slightly complicated to make sure that we actually catch everything and we ignore everything that we don't need to catch. So, so this unknown thing here was uh, only referring to unknown types. Yes, yeah, so I was wondering, um Given the false positives which you are uh, mentioning, isn't there a temptation to uh, eliminate type specs, not necessarily altogether, but moving into the direction of leaning on dialyzer's own work, so to say, instead of writing one of its own type specs because someone runs the risks of future false positives? Like, what what's the what's your view on? the worry about the type specs going bad over time or something to that effect? O or no, someone simply writing them wrong? Yeah, so we didn't worry about that. Our problem was that the type specs were bad to begin with. Like the type spec had been written and large parts of the type specs were in bad shape. So, and we didn't really know. So as, we, as they improved kind of over time, we started relying on them more and more. And we didn't consider kind of moving away from type specs because they're kind of unreliable, difficult to deal with. Um, if we would have had kind of running dialects from the beginning, then the, dial the, the type specs would have kind of been forced to be kept in shape as you change the code. Uh, but so our problem was largely to kind of get from a point where you have lots of false positives caused by bad specs and try to fix these one by one so they actually get into good shape. Uh, so we, uh, we are still using type specs uh, extensively, yes. All right, we, we have no time for more questions, I'm sorry. We have, but we have one of the questions over here. Can is if it's a really quick. Okay. And if you want more questions, that is the Whova app you can ask there later. Do you have policies on uh, writing type specs, type specs uh, in the code, or uh, like, are you always needed to write in the in the type spec now? No, we don't have any we don't have any policies for that. We encourage people to write type specs um, in pull requests. Uh, so during code review, we will often have like, please write a type spec for this, especially if there's an exported function but we don't have any kind of formal policy that everything. So for example, we're not, we're not enforcing type specification on every function, uh, but we, we encourage it during code review. All right, another round of applause, thank you.